led by FedEx, which uh, guided below street expectations. There's a look at the Dow Industrials, uh, down 63 points at 92.18. Over at NASDAQ, another Throughout the world today, the forces of globalization uh, and the power and influence of global corporations are fundamentally altering the way we all live. Internationally, capitalism has triumphed and the doctrine of free markets, minimal government, and private solutions to social problems is the established view as the only choice for countries that want to survive in a global economy. Yet despite the promises of globalization, the gap between rich and poor continues to grow, and communities, and even nations, are losing control of their economies. For many people, Feelings of impotence and vulnerability have given way to anger and resistance. But there is already a different, creative, and positive response that needs to be more widely known. I'm Patrick Watson. As a broadcast journalist over the past 45 years, I've put quite a bit of effort into trying to keep my personal views out of my programs, or at least to import contrary views in the interests of balance and fairness and impartiality. But the program that follows asks us to consider a locally controlled form of economic democracy that seems to me capable of living side by side with today's dominant globalized capital in a way that benefits everyone. And so I've agreed this time to set aside my cautions and to contribute my narration to a story that I believe needs to be told, even though it's going to be told in a somewhat unjournalistic posture of advocacy for the movement that it portrays. The story begins in a region of northern Italy called Emilia Romagna. <laughs> Here, people have combined an intense entrepreneurial spirit with the traditions of social democracy to produce one of the world's most sophisticated cooperative economies. The city of Bologna is the bustling center of this unique region. A third of the economic wealth comes from 15,000 cooperatives, which are owned and controlled by their members. Cooperatives work side by side with other forms of private enterprise and with the public sector. From the production of internationally renowned food products to the design and export of state-of-the-art machinery, co-ops have helped make Emilia-Romagna the economic powerhouse of Italy. The Emilian cooperative economy has allowed thousands of the region's small enterprises to thrive in a global marketplace, producing full employment and a standard of living among the highest in the world. Cooperation has become a way of life here. Italian co-ops took their inspiration from England from Rochdale, where co-ops were created to relieve the desperate working conditions and mass unemployment caused by the Industrial Revolution. The cooperative movement in Italy began in the mid-1800s, when mechanization in agriculture left many farm workers destitute. The early cooperators of Italy survived by pooling their labor and sharing what work was available. But the movement for economic justice was a bitter political struggle in Italy, as it was throughout Europe. The old order opposed any change that weakened its hold on economic power. By the 1900s, cooperatives had spread to the cities, where consumers used co-ops to protect their interest in the marketplace. Today, the practice of cooperation has grown to include the production and marketing of goods made by small, privately owned firms and to the delivery of social services. Campania Unica in Genoa dates back to 1324, when it started as a longshoremen's association. With a workforce of 1700, this co-op now operates Europe's second busiest port. Throughout Italy, there are hundreds of industrial co-ops like this, which are global leaders in their fields. 
SACME is a worker co-op whose members direct operations in nearly a dozen countries. From its humble beginnings as a mechanics co-op in the early 1900s, SACME's 600 workers generate a multi-million dollar business in the design and production of machinery for the ceramics industry around the world. For worker members, a job at SACME is usually a job for life. Despite the achievements of SACME and many other cooperatives, the co-op model is not without its critics. Massimo Bucci is regional president of Confindustria, representing the country's largest corporations. Uh, the people from Emilia-Romagna have a characteristic that is uh, that they like to stay together and they know how to stay together and to join forces and to join purposes. So uh, this is a basis okay, of the character of the people living here that has supported and helped the creation of cooperative. I can compare the efficiency of uh, cooperative with uh, capitalist firms. Uh, sometimes I have to say that cooperative for the kind of uh, uh, structure that they uh, represent have sometimes, I repeat, more uh, difficulties in comparison with uh, capitalist firms in putting together all the members of the cooperatives and to find a solution, to take a decision. I don't agree with those who criticize a cooperative for slow decision making and poor management. If decisions are made in a prompt and timely fashion, and all members are involved on a day-to-day -day basis in current problems, then, when they are called to a meeting, they are ready to make a decision either way. This procedure becomes more efficient and this results in the cooperative making decisions the way a private enterprise would in terms of speed but with the advantage that if a decision is made by 280 people, this is the number of our members, this will be far more considered and ultimately a more sound decision. The most important thing not only for co-ops, but also for private films, is the involvement of the people working there. It's the same as SACMI, where the workers and the people will get involved in a problem, and when they get involved, they make an effort to solve the problem, because the problem becomes their own problem, not only the co-ops. Cooperatives are among the largest engineering and construction firms in Italy. Coop Costruzioni is a worker co-op that plays a major role in construction and public works projects. It has been a leader in the restoration of Bologna's historic city center. The fact is, the citizen of a modern society uh, not only is happy to consume the usual consumer goods. They need more and more relational goods, namely the way in which that good or service is produced. When, for instance, we read in the newspaper that a certain group of, or a certain organization boycotts a product of that company or another company because they happen to know that the product itself has been produced exploiting children, exploiting disabled people, or not paying enough to the workers, what do we mean? These people boycott, not because the good itself uh, does not enjoy the usual characteristics in terms of quality, but because they object to the particular way that product has been brought to the market. The best example of consumer power in the marketplace is Italy's chain of retail co-ops. With four million members and 1,300 outlets, these co-ops are the country's largest distributors of food products. They provide consumers with a powerful means to influence the economy. 
Food safety and consumer protection are a fundamental part of the co-op's success. Food products are purchased only from environmentally secure sources, and the co-op's own brand name appears on 2,000 products that have met stringent quality and production standards. Genetically modified foods are banned. The co-op is a leader in the sale of organic products. Products like meat and dairy are traceable to individual source animals and farms. The trust between Italy's consumer co-ops and their members was evident at the height of the mad cow epidemic. While meat sales in major supermarkets plummeted by 30% overnight, the meat sales of Italy's consumer co-ops fell by only 5%. Co-ops play a vital role in the cultural life of Emilia-Romagna. The regional government provides the highest per capita spending on culture in Italy, and co-ops operate a large number of the 300 theaters that thrive in the region. I myself think that it is easier for artists to um, build up a cooperative that in a way um, uh, uh, meets the problems of organization that artistic uh, institutions naturally have, uh, but at the same time uh, responds more to the idea of creativity uh, than instead having uh, a, a private uh, entrepreneur that um, of course only wants money, profits, and creativity for him is a means to an end of enrichment and, and not a, an end in itself. Uh, so I, I really think that uh, the cooperative uh, um, form is more near to the idea of creativity that is connected with art and uh, is more respect to respectful of the creativity than is a uh, private organization. The cooperative model also plays a crucial role in a powerful small firm economy, which uses cooperation to help private entrepreneurs penetrate global markets. Here in the town of Pajibonsi, over 200 furniture makers export 80% of the products they make, mostly to U.S. markets. These craftsmen and women collaborate on everything from furniture design and production to marketing. And like the region's cooperatives, small private firms have been aided by government policies that encourage cooperation. Well, actually, this is what the Emilians have done, is that the history of Emilia is tr transposing the kind of farming model over into the light industrial model. If you trace the history of these, many of these people have got, had their roots in that basis and in the food industry. They come directly from it. So that the idea of saying that Amelia is a private uh, enterprise economy, that is what it is, just as a farming area is. And I think is one of its secrets. Because you don't have the wrangles that you have in some co-ops, uh, some industrial co-ops about, you know, some people wanting to, to lead and the marketing people wanting to be paid three times as much and all that type of thing. That is organized, if you like, within the structure of the four small firm and the four small family firm. They've got that cell organized in that way. But what the difference is, that, is that because they remain, for the most part, small and medium firms, they have developed cooperative structures, as we would recognize them, amongst themselves. And that, for those of us in Britain, uh, when we first uh, met the Italian thing, that widened the concept of co-ops and I think made it very, very relevant uh, to the modern age. What was fascinating is in the food industry because there you had cooperative retail being extremely strong. You had the political forces, as it were, in local power. They made sure that big international retail chains could not get planning permission to go into their towns, i.e. their own co-ops maintained control of retail. That meant that the farmer cooperatives always had a secure outlet. 
In the town of Carpi, just outside Bologna, ESSA Industries shows how small, high-tech firms can compete on a global stage. Today, these small companies have a future only if they learn to work together. Networking is very important for small firms because in this way they can specialize on a particular product. In this way, we can do our job best, of course, by putting together our knowledge which has increased with time and our skills together with our networking partners. Then we are more useful to our customers and this becomes a winning concept and helps us compete in a global market. The success of the Emilian model is evident in the shop windows of the world's most exclusive stores. The co-ops and small firms of Emilia-Romagna show how small regions can use the cooperative model to compete successfully in a modern market economy. The advantage of a cooperative firm vis-à-vis -vis a typical capitalistic firm is uh, threefold. First, that in a cooperative firm because the mutuality principle implies the million rule according to which one had one vote, people, members of the cooperatives are incentivated to um, uh, exhibit the best effort. We should never forget that in capitalistic firm, in order to avoid free riding and shirking, the management have to spend a tremendous amount of money in terms of monitoring, in terms of counseling, in terms of uh, introducing penalties, and all this uh, represents uh, an addition to the cost of production. The second comparative advantage has to do with the fact that the cooperative firm does not exist by itself, but it's part of a network. A capitalistic firm, in order to enjoy some benefits from another capitalistic firm, they have to sign up a special agreement, which is costly in terms of cost of transactions, etc. etc. That is not the case of a, a cooperative firm, because being part of a network, they can sign up what are called relational contracts. The third comparative advantage has to do with what I said a few minutes ago, namely that a cooperative firm is capable to interpret the new needs of the new consumers. A consumer knows that the product coming out from a cooperative firm is a product where the production process does not exploit anybody. <laughs> Canada's early co-ops were inspired by the success of the co-op movement in Britain. Their ideals were forged by British immigrant workers who brought their co-op experience with them to Canada. In Nova Scotia, a priest named Moses Cody taught the co-op model to fishermen and fish plant workers. In 1900, the credit union movement took root in Quebec, led by Alphonse Desjardins. Like the wheat pools in the West, all these initiatives transformed both the economy and community life. Today there are over 10,000 cooperatives in Canada, with 18 million members and assets worth $170 billion. Thank you for calling Coast Capital Savings. Canada is a world leader in the use of co-ops for financial services. In BC alone, one in three people belongs to a credit union. Credit unions like Coast Capital Savings are pioneers in the movement to maintain control of capital for the benefit of local communities. Van City is Canada's largest credit union and has earned its reputation as a progressive and innovative financial institution by matching its social goals with its economic performance. Welcome to the 56th Annual General Meeting of Vancouver City Savings Credit Union. My name is Greg McKay. Born in the 1940s, Vancouver City Savings gave the city's poorest neighborhoods access to credit for the first time. 
Van City was the first financial institution to offer members medical insurance and to make loans to women without the written consent of their husbands. Today, 30% of Van City's profits are returned to members and the local community. In contrast, the major banks return less than 1% to the community. With 1.6 million members, Mountain Equipment Co-op is a well-known consumer co-op and a national leader in ethical retailing. In addition to careful sourcing of its products to ensure the proper treatment of workers, a portion of the co-op's revenues is allocated to environmental protection. And while the clothing and sports equipment industry has been criticized for using offshore sweatshop labor, Mountain Equipment Co-op is an example of how Canadian consumers are using co-ops to promote their values in the marketplace. But the use of the co-op model has yet to reach other vital areas of Canada's economy. Many communities lack control over the use of natural resources that are the lifeblood of their economies. Annually, BC's forests generate millions of dollars in profits to 10 companies which control over half of the province's allowable cut. The control of this vital resource by a handful of corporations has meant that local sawmills and artisans and small wood producers have almost no access to Canada's largest forests. It has also meant that industrial logging practices, large volume exports of raw timber and clear cutting have devastated large swaths of BC's forests. By contrast, the Eco Lumber Co-op is pioneering a new approach that uses sustainable logging practices that preserve ancient forests for future generations. The co-op is providing an innovative solution for meeting consumer demands for wood products while protecting the environment and strengthening local economies. The co-op will sell only products that have been harvested according to strict environmental standards and certified by the Forest Stewardship Council. The FSC label guarantees that the product comes from a well-managed forest and in turn allows consumers to make a choice to buy ecologically and socially responsible forest products. The co-op also works with small-scale community forests that are committed to environmentally responsible logging practices. Like organic agriculture, ecoforestry is at the leading edge of a new attitude that reconciles enterprise with broader environmental and social values. These and hundreds of other examples across Canada point to a revival of cooperatives as an alternative to corporate models of doing business. The blend of craftsmanship, small-scale production, local control, and regional cooperation is a new strategy for Canada's regional economies. More importantly, there is a growing thirst among all classes of Canadians for a new set of values which can humanize our economy and still build prosperity alongside the apparently irreversible growth of globalization. I totally disagree about uh, the opinion that a cooperative could be more democrat than a capitalist firm or uh, more uh, just, social, socially wise, than a capitalist firm. If a cooperative lose money and is not ex efficient, so, and uh, a, cop a capitalist firms that have employees and pay salaries, pays good salaries to the people. So this is, again, is a company that is not socially just or is less democrat than a cooperatives. I don't think that we can say the right, uh, the good part is one, is one side and the worst part is the other side. It's true that the private sector generates significant benefits. None of us can argue that. But I, I think what they found in uh, Bologna is that uh, there's an alternative way of achieving the same commercial ends, but uh, providing greater involvement and productivity uh, from the workers and, uh, and a kind of uh, the creation of a climate of reciprocity in the, in the community. And it's a marvelous mix that makes an enormous difference, benefits all of the private sector players and benefits the community dramatically. It's a very different answer than the giant, multinational, modern, uh, international corporation. 
and uh, it shows in the community form and the community benefits. Uh, this is one of the richest regions in Europe. They've got there by cooperating and competing. And the Europeans now see it as the model for underdeveloped parts of Europe. That tells you almost everything in terms of what they've achieved. Critics of globalization of capital and its challenge to local economies have always argued that it is essentially destructive, while corporate leaders and government leaders have said that it's essential for growth and prosperity. For a while, the political and economic left tried to persuade us that only public ownership of big elements of the economy could counteract the negative effects of globalization, but people don't trust big bureaucracies, and we didn't buy into this. So it could be that the co-op movement, resolutely committed to market forces and built on entrepreneurial values, is a harmonious and balanced approach, a constructive thing that sustains global enterprise by giving people everywhere more buying power, and at the same time giving those global customers a voice in the marketplace, and reviving a sense of community and common purpose that the prevailing values of self-gratification and consumerism have virtually killed.